Welcome, folks, to this edition of the Market Signals Podcast. My name is Mark Zabicki, uh, Chief Investment Officer of LPL Financial. Uh, joining me is Adam Turnquist, LPL Financial's Chief Technical Strategist. Uh, Adam, always good to be with you. How are you? Thanks for having me, Mark. Good to be back on. All good for 2023 so far. Good, good. And we're going to put you to work today a little bit, talking talking technicals and some other things. Um but just want to let people know who are listening to this podcast. We are recording on Tuesday, uh, January 10th. So we're recording Tuesday, January 10th. Looking at last week, um, not a whole lot actually to report on. Um, we did have a big lift uh, on on Friday. I think you know maybe some of that was really driven by a relatively weak December that we got. Um, uh, for the S and P 500 index, so that gave way to some a little bit of a relief rally. I think on on Friday, U, U.S. non farm payrolls Friday's numbers were about expected. Unemployment was a little bit lower uh, than expected, 3.5 percent versus 3.7 percent, which is the prior month reading. But our average hourly earnings year over year uh, decelerated to a 4.6 percent rate versus a 5.1% you know, prior reading. So not a whole lot of great news out of the, the jobs number in terms of the federal, what the, how the Federal Reserve thinks about it. Um, although maybe the average hour early earnings, uh, average hourly earnings did help. Um, it's probably just a little bit more of a relief rally. We did see some weakness in services economy and factories order data, factory orders data that probably just um, continue that expectation that the Federal Reserve is is likely near the end of its tightening cycle. So maybe that was uh, some reason for a little bit of the relief on on Friday as well. Um, fairly decent performance due to that Friday's number or Friday's performance from the S and P five hundred index and other indices in the U S. Um, you know, in generally mixed across the rest of the globe. But, uh, you know, Adam, I know you've got some insight into some internals that are going on in the market. What, what, are you, what are you watching as we get the year started? Yeah, it's been an interesting start to 2023 when you just look at the breakdown in performance overall. We are higher on the year, but a lot of that's been kind of this worst to first rally. Some of the beaten up stocks across last year's losers are starting to outperform. So we're seeing that relief rally play out. A big part of that was was Friday. Uh, Friday's price action with some of those oversold names catching a bid um, as we start 2023. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll see if that if, if that you know generally continues. I think again some of that expectation of Federal Reserve policy tightening coming to an end is probably um, a reason for some of that. And, and then again, that that was a the read through in the bond market probably last week or so um, as yields you know came down as as that those Fed ex expectations were built into uh, all four corners of capital markets. Uh, looking this week for uh, data in the U.S. Uh, economic data, it's all going to be about the CPI number really you know on Thursday. I think that's going to be fairly clear. We're de still dealing with a market that's trading around you know inflation expectations and and Fed policy. Uh, looking outside of the U.S., we are. Um, getting a mixture of data, some industrial production and manufacturing activity data out of the UK. Later in the week on Friday, CPI from Japan um, was a little bit higher than than expected. You know, be an interesting number there. Um, and then some export import data out of uh, China. You know, midweek really kind of uh, highlights the non US uh, non US economic calendar. Um, looking ahead to key issues this week, um, really, and, and this um, this hasn't really been a key issue for us in this forum. Really, is is the the ten year Treasury note auction on Wednesday, and it's typically it's there's hasn't been a whole lot happening with the ten year Treasury note auction. The reason why we're bringing it up today is is that. Um, is the question are bonds back to being bonds? Meaning, you know, is is the trend year ten year Treasury note auction, which has been relatively weak on the bid side um, for the past several sessions, uh, are people are actually going to look to get back into bonds 
uh, again, as that equity buffer and also as as some some opportunities in the bond market still abound as far as, as we're concerned um, as the Federal Reserve, again, begins to near the end of its tightening cycle. So something to kind of keep an eye on there. Clearly, it's all going to be about Thursday's U.S. CPI number. Um, and again, the markets inflation and Fed driven, and we think disinflation momentum is in fact strong. That meaning um, CPI is likely going to trend lower throughout the balance of 2023. That's our expectation. Um, and so far, I think the markets reacted generally positively over the last several months because um, we are starting to see a deceleration in, in U.S. You know, CPI. Thursday, jobless claims, Friday, University of Michigan sentiment, and then also Friday, and, and I know, Adam, you're going to touch on this, um, U.S. bank earnings, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, um, and Citigroup, things to look forward to. But um, turning to you, Adam, on the technical read of, of the U.S. equity market, and, and I know you got quite a bit to talk about uh, in this session of market signal. So um, what do you have for us? Yeah, so new year, but same bear market, unfortunately. But we're starting to make a, a little progress here on the technicals. So the chart I brought with today looks at the S&P 500 on top. Then we have a momentum indicator called RSI or the relative strength index in the middle panel. The bottom panel looks at breadth. So we're looking at how many stocks within the S&P are above their 200-day moving average. And when you start breaking this down, just the most recent price action, you can see we're basically range-bound and down, I'm calling it. We're stuck below 3,900, stuck below the 50-day moving average. And we've really just been consolidating sideways um, over the last several weeks. Support's coming into play for the S&P 500 at 3,800. And when you talk about a new year, there's always uh, New Year's resolutions, Mark. I don't know if you have any for this year. I won't I won't have you announce them or ask what they are. <laughs> uh, I certainly have a few. Um, but for the S&P 500, in terms of the New Year's resolutions that I kind of came up with on the technical side, and just to, to get out of this bear market, clearing and holding that 3,900 is top of the list for the start of the year. So that would be number one for the S&P 500. Let's get above and hold. 3,900. That's been a, a really critical area of, of support and resistance. I was looking at the actual average price going back to the June lows for the S&P 500. And when you take every single trade for the index, uh, for the futures, that is, the average price uh, as of yesterday, um, just over that time frame, was 3,904. So you think about all the price memory and supply and demand that's kind of formed around that 3,900 level. I think that's why it's been so critical, um, at least recently, and, and been a pretty good area of resistance. Seen that play out yesterday um, with yet, or yesterday's rally in the morning. Similar to 2022, we fumbled those gains by the close and then broke back below 3,900. So that would be one area of resistance to watch. Um, going back to that New Year's resolution list, um, the next one would be for, you know, to get out of this bear market would be um, to recapture that 200-day moving average. That'd be the, the next major level to watch that's just below 4,000. Um, I think if we can get above that, you know, the likely retest of the, the January 22 highs, um, that would increase the probabilities there. But still stuck in a downtrend, still in a bear market. But underneath the surface, it, underneath the surface it's, it's not as dire as it may sound. We're starting to see breath hold up with, you know, looking at the percentage of stocks that are above their 200-day moving average. Um, you're at around 57%. I, I think that's pretty good, Mark, just given what we saw in December. You know, I think it was a 6% sell-off, one of the worst Decembers, uh, I think going back to 2018. And breath held up pretty well. Compare that to some of the pullbacks that we've seen um, at prior failures at the 200-day. And breath... Um, you know, breath metrics were damaged a lot worse than what we've seen, at least so far with the S and P 500. And, 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 you know, one of the, one of the positives to take away, I think from this chart, Adam, and you're the expert here from a technical perspective is, is the, is the willingness to hold that support at 3,800, right? So um, we saw it, we're seeing it in June, July, we're seeing it in, you know, kind of October, November, 
And then, uh, although we are consolidating in a narrow range, as you mentioned, that willingness to, to, to hold 3,800 has got to be uh, a positive to walk away with, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a great point. And I think, you know, let's say we do bounce out of 3,800 to the upside. You know, part of the anatomy of a bottom is a higher low that you start to form as a new uptrend develops. And that might be this 3,800 level um, if we do see this breakout and eventually reverse the downtrend. Just not enough technical evidence to get there. I would note that momentum is actually picking up a little bit too. It's been a pretty quick shift when the when you look at the momentum indicators that we use. Um, I included RSI here. And you basically are back above the midline. So that's the 50, 50 level for RSI. So typically when you're in a in a bull market or at least a constructive um, part of a recovery should be above 50. Um, that's kind of the, the, the threshold with RSI. I didn't include it in this chart, but we did get a, a MACD buy signal. So some other momentum indicators are pointing you know, to this potentially breaking out to the upside. We'll see, I, I think, as you noted earlier, CPI is going to be the big event this week. I don't know if we're going to get above that in, until you know we we get at least the CPI report or potentially a glimpse at some of the earnings that are coming out on Friday. So those will be, I think, the major catalysts that will at least move us above or below this this 3,800, 3,900, or 3,800 support or 3,900 resistance. Yeah, yeah, fair point. And then on the on the correlate, I know you've done a little work here on correlation. So, so for the viewers uh, of this podcast, what what are they seeing here in this chart? In this yeah, segment? so we took a little bit different approach. I, I kind of bucket this into the seasonality bucket in terms of research, but we took the more quantitative quantitative approach to seasonality with this study, um, and it's pretty interesting. So we we looked at the daily progression of every single calendar year going back to 1950. So how those returns progress throughout each year. And then we ran a correlation analysis for every single year, comparing it to 2022, just to see what years were the highest correlated um, to 2022, just given how unique it was as a year. I mean, we, we were, I think it was the fourth worst year, um, I believe for the S&P 500 going back to 1950, the first day of the year had a record high and, and that was it. So it was a pretty unique year in terms of price action. So we tried to flush out any similarities, um, you know, over those 70 plus years. And this table actually breaks down all of the correlation coefficients. So these are the years that are, have the highest correlation to last year. So at the top of the list is 1962. Um, there was a bear market during that year. Fed funds were marginally higher during that year. But I think it's interesting to note there was no recession um, during 1962 and no recession the following year. Um, and the returns, when you add all these high correlation periods up, um, they average just about 12% over the next year with most occurrences also positive at 83%. So there's some more metrics that are included in our blog um, that was out on Friday afternoon that, that breaks this down in greater detail. But I think when you look at it, First, you have to make the disclaimer that correlation is it does not mean causation. Um, so we'll throw that out there as a disclaimer. And then just as seasonality in general, it's just really one input into our decision making process. But it, it does check the box, you know, for another positive seasonality trend for 2023. Yeah, I, well, well said. And, and there's a few others, but, you know, kind of, you know, the year after a midterm election year is one of them. And and the, there's only four times and since the depression era where the S and P 500 actually was negative in back to back years. So um, so so that that's a that's a rarity for that to happen. One of the reasons, I mean, it's it's a tool for the toolbox, but one of the reasons why we were we're fairly positive on equity markets. You know, for 2023, I call it you know I call it cautiously constructive. So. Um, looking at Friday, you know, Adam, as you mentioned, um, you know, bank earnings are out. What is what is the takeaway from this chart? Yeah, so we're looking at the S and P five hundred financial sector here on top, and the bottom panel is the ratio chart. So the financial sector versus the S and P five hundred, and I think it's really interesting, just given where we're at um, as we come into to Q four earnings reporting, which kicks off on Friday with several of the major banks. 
um, reporting Friday morning. And we're right at this inflection point with financials. So we've had this bounce off support that goes back to the pandemic lows. Man the sector's managed to hold above that support level, reverse uh, an intermediate downtrend. And now we're just kind of consolidating, consolidating right below this key area of overhead resistance. We're starting to see momentum pick up on the absolute price chart. You can see the 50-day the just crossed above the 200-day moving average. So a pretty good sign in terms of the direction of where this could play out, which would be um, the implications there would be to the upside. And then when you look at the bottom panel, it's al always a relative game when you're managing assets. And that's um, this is the the financial sector versus the S&P. And you can see this range bound price action in terms of relative performance for the sector, really going back to um, early 2021. And the ratio chart is right at the upper end of that range. Um, I know we're we're neutral on the sector from our, our strategy team. I think if you do see this break out above that range, it'd be a pretty good sign, not just for the financial sector, but I think the implications for a offensive or more cyclical sector starting to outperform, that's a really good sign for the S&P 500 overall. Because right now, Mark, I mean, the leadership is not really screaming a uh, breakout or a bottom, um, you know, with consumer yep. staples and some of the defensive names outperforming. So we'll we'll see what happens as earnings. I don't um, I know uh, Jeff Bookbinder was highlighting, um, you know, so the earnings bar has been lowered by quite a bit as we come into earnings season. So we'll see how it plays out. It was a rough earnings period last quarter. So uh, I think that low bar will certainly help. Yeah, I think well said. I mean, we'll, we'll likely need financial, the financial sector to to show some positive momentum in order to kind of break out of the you know the the range that you mentioned for the S and P five hundred. So that's a that's a great point. We'll see if we'll see if um, some of the major banks on Friday have uh, anything good to deliver to uh, investors. Then um, and then it, it's the eight hundred pound gorilla, which is inflation. So um, what what's the takeaway from this chart? Yeah, this is looking at swap rates that are basically applied to CPI. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds here with, with what exactly how these work, but it's basically a contract between a, a fixed and a variable payment. What gets flushed out is, a, is an ex expectation of inflation expressed through swap contracts. And this chart shows the implied year-over-year -year CPI rates. Um, so when you look at the, the blue line on top, that's a month ago where the market had priced CPI. Um, the orange line is the, or sorry, yeah, the orange line, make sure I had those right, is actually the most current reading in CPI. So when you look at this, the key takeaway is we've seen a shift lower in that term structure of the swap rate. So basically the market's saying we've, over the last month, we've reduced our expectations for headline CPI coming into Thursday's CPI print. So you can see, um, I don't have it highlighted, but I think um, per the swap contracts, they're priced at uh, 638 for the one month contract. That's actually below current estimates for tomorrow or Thursday CPI, which I think estimates last time I looked were at six and a half percent on that year over year number. So long story short, a, a constructive view implied through the swap rate for Thursday's CPI print. Yeah, and and that's it's consistent with our expectation for for months and months now. Is that is in in the I think the market's going to react a little bit more positively, and will likely con continue to react a, react a little bit more positively as we see that directional change in inflation that we've already begun to see. Um, speaking of directional change, we've seen that in the U.S. dollar, and and I'm I'm asking you, Adam, is that directional change going to continue? Uh, or is it going to you know, reverse back toward the highs that we've seen? I, I guess this chart helps explain whether one or, or the other is going to happen. Yeah, we're we're getting to this binary level. It's a another big question for the market right here with the dollar index. I don't think we're getting back to the old highs. I don't I don't know exactly how we would get there from a macro view that doesn't yeah. really play out on the technical side as well. Um, you know, we've seen a pretty big breakdown in the dollar to say the least, really. Um, just going back to the the fall highs, you know, that were around 115. As you know, inflation has shown that you know it's likely peaked and it's starting to come down. 
across various metrics that obviously applies to interest rate policy, which applies to the dollar. And that's what we're seeing with the dollar index. Um, coming into this key area of support that we've been highlighting, it's at 103. Um, that goes back to your March 20 highs. And that also aligns with an uptrend that's been in place going back to, you know, over the last year and a half. So 103 is going to be really critical for the dollar to hold. If we do break below that, um, you know, look for look for more downside, even down to the, the $100 level for the U.S. dollar index. And we are seeing, again, momentum turn bearish and, and really confirm that this, this is a new trend change um, or it's pointing to a new trend change. You can see the 50-day the here is about to cross, or I think it actually has crossed now below the 200-day. So in the technical parlance, it's a, a bearish or a death cross, um, but not a good sign for momentum. And then on the bottom panel is another look at RSI. And that's, as you can see, sub 50. So that's bearish territory for the dollar. And you're really not oversold yet either. So I think there's scope for, for more downside in the dollar. Of course, it's a, a relative game with other, monet or, uh, other monetary policies across the globe. But I think at least there's a little more clarity with the Fed. I don't know, Mark, versus the ECB or the European Central Bank or even the Bank of Japan. I think that's probably part of this chart as well. Yeah, cor correlation with the U.S. dollar in the in the likely direction of inflation and in, in Federal Reserve policy. You know, um, as the Federal Reserve eases off the break, um, the dollar is likely going to get a little bit weaker. Um, and certainly, uh, I'm with you. Not back to the highs that we saw. Um, that that's typically a weaker dollar bodes well for for international equity markets. Um, we're still favoring the U.S. equity market today. Although we are raising our eyebrow of what's going on in, in non-US equity markets of late, specifically Europe, especially as inflation um, begins to look like it wants to roll over there. So um jury's still out on that. Um so walk us through the view on gold, Adam. Yeah. So naturally a, a weaker dollar, we have to talk about gold, I think. And this is looking at gold futures over the last several years. And on the top panel, you can see. You know, they've reversed the declining price channel um, earlier this year, and we we're looking at a bottom, and that's really getting more and more confirmation. We've seen gold futures get back into this range, um, recapture several areas of overhead resistance, including their 50 and 200 day moving average. So I think realistically, when we look ahead for 2023, I would not be surprised for gold to climb back to those old highs that we've seen. Um, with this kind of, we'll call it a double top earlier, but, you know, back to this almost 2100 level for gold futures, you know, there's not a, a lot of major resistance in the way. And you can see on the bottom panel here, I, I included the gold futures positions. This is um, managed money. So more speculative positions, basically it nets out longs and shorts. And that's what the number on the bottom panel includes. So, you know, gold long positions are starting to build from negative levels. You can see where some of the other peaks um, occurred and we're well below that in terms of getting, you know, overbought with futures positions and even on RSI. So I think there's more room to run with gold certainly um, lines up with our, our bullish view or positive view on precious metals you can include silver in here as well. That's been another constructive looking chart. Yeah, and, and and then lastly, for this edition of the Market Signals podcast, I mean, we've gotten a lot of questions on gold, frankly, lately. We've gotten a lot of questions uh, on on China as well. Um, a lot of a lot of unanswered questions still on, on on China fundamentals, but but what does the technical picture picture hold there, Adam? Yeah, don't ask me any uh, fundamentals on China or COVID because I it's it's a interesting, we'll call it backdrop, what's going on in China. But what the technicals are saying, it, it cuts through that noise. And I think evidence for a bottom, at least in the MSCI China index that, I'm, that I brought with today, um, is growing. So we've had this massive rally off support. I think we're up 45, 50%. I don't know the number as of today. Um, off those lows, you know, the, the rally has been overbought pretty much the whole way. And as I said, is the rally over? Um, of course, you know, it, the trajectory of these gains are, are not sustainable, but you never know when, when momentum shifts and these, these major downtrends get, get reversed, 
where that momentum will eventually fade. So I think you have to be cautious here. Um, you're extremely overbought across every single metric. You know, I, I have RSI on here. You're at a 77 reading. You know, if you scroll to the left, you can see the last time we were at high on RSI was back at the peak of the MSCI China index. Not saying that's going to play out this time coming off a of bottom here, but I think you have to be a little cautious on the technicals. I think the the message here is that a bottom has likely been set. I don't think this uptrend is sustainable at this rate of change. So, um, you know, if you are interested in, in China, I think at least tactically, you need to wait for, make sure this $70 um, resistance, or which will now be support holds, and wait for some of these overbought conditions to subside. And then lastly, is just looking at the um, M MSCI China index versus the S&P 500 ratio chart. And it has reversed a downtrend and we're starting to climb out of a bottom. Um, I, I've noted earlier, I think, um, and, and some of the other calls that I've done, it's just, you know, when you reverse a downtrend, it does not immediately translate into being in an uptrend. A lot of times you can just form a consolidation pattern and resume the prior downtrend, but you will, you know, you really need to make a higher high as it, it, simple as that is. You know, that's the checking the box for an uptrend. So we haven't seen that yet with the MSCI China index versus the S&P, but definitely something on our radar with our uh, strategic and tactical asset allocation committee. Yeah, I mean, our our work, again, still favors U.S. equity markets. I mean, um, you have to be highly tactical um, in emerging markets in general terms. We're getting a little bit of a tailwind from the the falling dollar and some, um, you know, new COVID policy from China. It remains to be seen if that um, continues, as you mentioned, Adam, in terms of asset allocation work. Um, so cautious on emerging markets in general, and we'll wait till see um, more signs of of sustained improvement for some of these markets before we we take any action from an asset allocation perspective. But Excellent points, as always, sir. Um, good to be with you. Thanks for running down uh, your work across multiple markets from a technical perspective. That'll do it for this edition of the Market Signals podcast. Adam Turnquist, uh, Chief Technical Strategist at LPL Financial. Mark Zabicki, Chief Investment Officer at LPL Financial. Good to be with you, as always. Um, and we'll see you back next week with the Market Signals podcast.